to say a word for the Lord. Amen. It's always good to have somebody who knows the Lord, somebody, amen, who, who, is, who is gifted, somebody who can really tell it like it ought to be told. Grandma, you know, back in the old days, you used to say, tell it like it T.I.T. is. Amen. And, and we have today for our commencement speaker, uh, the, uh, the Reverend Dr. Bishop uh, Benjamin Watts. Let me just tell you. Now, we know, we know Bishop Watts. We know him as a former president of the Connecticut State Missionary Baptist Convention. We know him as, uh, as he directs the Black Ministry Certificate Program at Hartford Seminary. We know him as pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church in New London, Connecticut. We know him as a great preacher, a great teacher, and we know him as one who can sing all he want to. Am I right about it? But we thank God that we also know of his commitment to education, his commitment to Christian education, his commitment to us in this Connecticut State Missionary Baptist Convention and our, the growth of our churches and the growth of our members. We know him and we thank God of his, for his dedication and who wants to lead us, uh, church persons, uh, church leaders, pastors, preachers, teachers, everybody. He has a commitment to Christian education. And it's my joy, and I could say so much more and talk about him as my friend and my brother, one who I look to, a great mentor. I love him, and I thank God for him. Listen, after we have our next music, the next voice that you will hear will be that of our great commencement speaker, preacher, teacher, uh, singer, everything, Bishop Benjamin Watts. With him I know I 
can stand No matter what may come my way My life is in your hand Oh, I know that I can make it I know that I can stand No matter what may come my way My life is in your hand Oh, with Jesus I can take it With Him I know I can stand going through something ought to say no matter what may come my way you got a doctor's appointment next week you ought to just say no matter may come my way my life you got people about ready to walk out of your life but no matter yeah I, my life is in. Folk done gave up on you, but no matter. Yeah, 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 my life. Oh, yeah. No matter what may come my way, my life. such an anointing in this place that every time someone stands to this mic they feel like they have to preach so, you all done did something somebody's been praying I, I tell you this will be a commencement address but y'all about to put a holler in my spirit I am delighted to stand here and to share with you, to be with Dr. Lindsay Curtis and First Lady Curtis. Let's thank God for them and not just him. He can't function the way he functions without having that wonderful support at the house and somebody blessing him and holding him together when y'all don't see how the stress is getting to him. Come on, let's thank God for them leading our convention.
Vice President at large, my friend and brother. Uh, he is just a wonderful person and an embodiment of testimony personified. Every time he moves, it's glory to God. When I hear him preach, I feel like shouting when he says, Amen. To my friend and good sister, Minister LaDonna Bowe, Lo, what a wonderful saint of God leading our women's auxiliary. <laughs> Reverend Powell, you tried to preach in here this morning. Right, I want to tell you, I told him that all the churches already had pastors. They need the candidate in here this morning. <laughs> sister Marge Wright, our dean, and to... That wonderful preacher from Waterbury, Reverend Calvert Brantley. I, I can't keep up with him. I, what a great man of God, our executive secretary. I'm blessed to see all of these people of God and saints of God here, y'all. I'm just glad to be standing next to y'all. Uh, matter of fact, these days I'm getting older and wiser. I'm just glad to be standing. I'm just <laughs> Hey Amen. I'm delighted uh, to be here. And Pastor Ingram, so good to see you, my brother. And uh, I'm just so glad to, to see these ladies over here work so diligently during my administration. Sister Robinson, Sister Mary Williams, I saw y'all over there. And I, I see some group bond there. All y'all saints and, and, and the pillar of Waterbury is here holding up the front corner of the church. Sister Amanda Williams, God bless you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Your pastor talking wonderful about you. I won't take but a few minutes. I, we only set aside a certain amount of time for this moment here. So I won't take but a few minutes. But in those few minutes, I hope to be thoughtful and provocative to the church as we are now shifting the paradigm for the 21st century. If you give me a moment, I'll elevate a word from you with you and just think on it with me. God, I love you and I thank you and I ask that you would bless us as we hear your word to be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 5 gives me the foundation for the thought I have. And I'm going to use the convention's theme, shifting the paradigm for the 21st century ministry. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them, in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. My brothers and sisters, as I lift this up for the next few moments, I want you to realize that the church is under attack. The body of Christ is under attack. The people of God are under attack. We are being pulled in every different direction. And what is so bad now is that at once I was worried that it was just the African-American church. I was asked back in 2012 to do an academic review. In my other life, I serve as the leader of the Black Ministries Program at Harvard Seminary. They allowed me to be the director here and I'm also a faculty associate in religion and community life. And a part of my task there, at times I review academic journals and articles before publication because if you're going to publish in major magazines, they have to be peer-reviewed. And so they sent an article to me for peer review for the review of religious research. And when they sent it to me, I was frustrated by the article. The article was an analysis of black and white biblical academic gap. 
the, the analysis was written up to talk about how the biblical literacy within the black church was so bad and so off-putting that it was understandable that some people who were of African-American descent were not as knowledgeable as scripture as were others who were non-pigmented. And it messed me up. I, I, I wrote a rather scathing appraisal of the article. I, I put it back and I talked about the broad sweeping generalizations without any kind of backing or finding, without any fact on the matter. And then as I was about to go off completely, I then started checking with some folk. And it messed me up because I began to realize that folk were going to church, but they weren't necessarily learning the word. Sunday school hour was a ghost town in many of our churches. Bible study can be had in the fellowship hall. Matter of fact, if you didn't want to have Bible study at all, nobody would even complain. People would not even get upset. We've cut out prayer meeting and no one says anything about it. We, we barely talk about the word anymore. And when we do, it's in fragmented pieces that are topical, that keep people going, that make people mesmerized, sit around saying, oh, give me some more of that. Without any real foundation in biblical truth, we grab one idea, chase all over the Bible, looking after faith, chase all over the Bible, looking after this word or that word, while never connecting the dots and exegetically we lift up what we think are hermeneutical imperatives which are not imperatives they are man made driven by the lust and desire of people to have their own way we lift up a word but it ain't to God people are coming to church with itching ears they want to hear something. They want to get something. They want to have something. They want somebody to make me shout, make me dance, make me run around the church, make me feel good, make me go out and go do my deed. But whatever thinking of, is my soul right? Where's my spirit at? Is God pleased with my life? I, and I struggle with this because... As someone who reads and studies the Bible, I get unnerved when I start reading statistics. You know, there are several, Pew Research has done much research in this area, and Life Research has done the same. Lifeway has come up with one, and it's not just African Americans. And it's not just Americans. British folk not going to church. Italians are not going to church. The Greeks are not going to church. It's not just those folk who look like you or who are Protestant, but Catholics are not going to church. Yesterday, they just put out that they will shrink down the number of churches within the Roman Catholic Diocese here in Connecticut. You have to know there's something going on in the earth realm. You, 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 you saints of God who have chosen to come and study, who have chosen to undergird your faith, who have chosen to take out your time and to go down and to read the book, to be pushed again. Some of you are not young babies. Some of you have been in the way a long time, but you still realize that it's important to undergird your faith. You are the foundation that we need to begin to fight and to change this paradigm in the 21st century. You, you're going to be on the front lines helping us to change what is happening around us. It is said now that 40% of the people attending church may read their Bible once or twice a month. One in five churchgoers never read it at all. Over 59% did not know that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish was in the Bible. In Great Britain, around 30% of parents in Great Britain now did not know that Adam and Eve, Dave, David and Goliath, or the Good Samaritan were biblical stories. Make matters worse, 27% think that Superman is a biblical character. More than one in three believe that the same about Harry Potter. 
Oh, well, maybe that wasn't bad enough. 54% believe that the Hunger Games is a story out of the Bible. What you don't realize is that it is not just that they don't know the Bible. It's that because they don't know the Bible, their theology is bad. So more than half of the people who were studied both in America and in Europe believe that the Holy Spirit is a power, but they don't recognize him to be the third person of the Godhead in the Trinity. They have no Trinitarian doctrine. They just have a power theology. They've lost their way. They've lost orthodox biblical principles. They've, they've lost the Trinity. They've lost the personhood of the Godhead. They don't understand those unbiblical views go to salvation and to sin and to humanity and to anything related to Jesus. They've lost Jesus. And nowadays, nobody preaches about sin. Gardner Taylor once said that uh, people have gotten so far away from sin, they, they have joined Carl Minniger, the Kansas psychiatrist, and they call it the cultural lag. Some of us have lost the concept of sin. I, and if this text, as I've read today, and I, I won't be much longer, if the text that I read today has anything to do with this moment, then, then, then it is to the church. That the writer writes, he writes to the church, yeah. and he gives the church some strange instructions for church folk. Yeah. Uh, maybe you haven't read the first few verses. Uh -huh. He has to tell church folk to keep their pants on. Yeah. Right. He has to tell church folk to go home to their own wives. He has to tell church folk how to act outside of church. Y'all missed that. It's in the text. He said, he says, he said, the reason I suggest to you that you have fallen asleep is that you have given way to secular indulgences. He said, he said, you, you in the church, but you don't realize that you can't be like the world. When you, when you study why people have become the nuns, nuns, that, that means they don't believe in nothing. They become nuns because they've given up on religion. They've given up on organized church. And some of them will say they gave up on it because of what they saw in the church. And I come to tell you that what the apostle was saying is, brothers and sisters, we cannot give in to our secular indulgences. Even if it won't send you to hell, it may send somebody else. He said, you, you've got to forgive us on your second indulgence. Then secondly, what I, I said to myself, Lord, why are we asleep? And then the Lord reminded me, is not only have we been caught up in our secular indulgences, but we have been caught up in our social indifference. We get so busy building church, having church, trying to pay for the church trying to keep the church, trying to wrestle with the church in a rough neighborhood, trying to keep the folk coming to church, trying to keep the music going at the church, trying to keep the lights on in the church, trying to keep the water out of the church. We get so busy trying to keep up with the church that we forget to do the work of the church. We give more money to everything other than mission work. We don't care about the homeless, the helpless, the hurting, or those that are lost, least, left behind, left out, and are on the road to hell with a handbasket. We, we have this issue with what I call secular indulgence, social indifference. 
you, 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 you still didn't get that. I, I, t- I can tell you, you're looking at me like, like, Reverend, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, most of us don't realize that the anniversary of the taking of those young black girls by Boko Haram passed in April. 300 girls taken yesterday. 82 of those girls were brought back. But the release of captives who were there, who were the same kind of individuals that would have taken them and raped them, happened in order to get 82 of those girls back. But most of us don't pay attention to that because we are socially indifferent. So most of us don't realize that in D.C. that there are hundreds of African-American and brown girls that are missing and nobody talks about it. And, and as if that wasn't bad, we'll forget the fact that there are 64,000 black women missing in the United States right now today. I didn't make that number up. That's the number that's given by the Black Missing Foundation. That's the number by Avis Jones Devers. That's the number that says there are 64 4,000 women of color, black and Hispanic women that are missing and nobody's looking for them. Social indifference, secular indulgence, social indifference. But I came here. I came here for y'all. I turned down three commencement speeches but I came here for y'all. I just want to give you this last thing. I came here because you are the leading edge of this last thing. You're the leading edge. You you may have read it in the text. The the text says this very clearly to them. He, He wants them to know this word. He says, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Tell tell somebody, we're going to put a light on it. Each of you, the more you know, the more you put a light on it. I got to get out there now. The more you know, the more you, you shed a light on it. He says, he said, and whatever makes manifest is light. He said, therefore, awake you. Look at somebody and tell it's time to wake up. He said, wake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I I thought I would leave you with this. I I said there was secular indulgence. I said there was social indifference. But I came tonight because all of you recognize that there is a spiritual insistence. In other words, the reason why we can't stop having the convention, the reason why you can't stop doing Christian education, the reason why you need a leadership school and training and Bible study is because we've got a spiritual insistence. We've got a God to answer to. We've got a charge to keep and a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, fitted for the sky. We've got work to do and God has called us to lift up the name of Jesus. He promised if I be lifted up from the earth, I don't care if everybody else wants to talk about other things. Let them talk about Buddha. Let them talk about Harry Krishna. Let them talk about other things. But I'll take Jesus for mine. Because if I be lifted up from the earth I I'll draw all men unto me. Touch somebody. Say, neighbor, help me live, Jesus. Help me live, Jesus.
to me that knowledge is a good thing. I think that's why the Bible says to think on these things. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are holy, think on these things. I told you, somebody said that this is a spiritual convention. Amen. Oh, Bishop, watch. Bishop Watts, amen, amen. It's good to hear you again, my brother. It's good to hear you, man, amen, amen. I hope what he has said to us reminds us why it's necessary to shift the paradigm. Can't continue just on the path of just going to church. But there is an expectation of a manifestation of going to church. Amen. <laughs> 